Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. A very good morning to all of you. A very humbly and very profoundly welcome you all in the first lecture of an online series which has been hosted by the Department of Business Administration of Government College Women University Sialkot, uh, duly headed by Dr. Yasid Munir under the leadership of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Rukhsana Kosar. I request you all to please keep your mics muted unless you have been requested to speak. This is a very excellent topic and uh, let me uh, first give you a brief intro about our honorable speakers. Today we have with us. Uh, I need uh, the uh, formal permission of our uh, honorable vice chancellor to start the session. Ma'am, please, can I? We allow to start. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. First, we have with us uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor from Tanzania. Let me share a brief profile of him so that you can uh, better know him. First of all, a very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you so much for being here with us today. All right. One second. Bro, please uh, unmute your mic. Um, Salam alaikum. Um, a very good morning to everyone. Can you guys hear me? Thank you so much. Doctor. Yes, we yeah. can clearly yeah, yeah. hear you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank okay, you so good. much for being here today with us. And allow me to share your brief profile here. Dr. Amran uh, used to be at the Azman Hashim International Business School, University of Technology, Malaysia. Professor Amran currently supervises only doctoral students and write journals for publication as per the requirement of the university. He has graduated 60 PhD students from UTM, one PhD student from South Asia University two PhD students from University of Southern Australia and 21 master students with 22 undergrad students. He is the principal investigator of 15 research products worth uh, 1.2 million and had also released headed 29 consultancy projects valued more than millions. He was the postgraduate examiner for 80 PhDs, BBAs and number of uh, master's students, an excellent profile. He has been into workshops and training and has participated in number of international conferences. And he is currently the vice chancellor of Al Sumeit University, Zanzibar, Tanzania. He is also the deputy council chairperson of Muslim University of Morogoro, Tanzania. As well as he is an adjutant professor at University Salavangor. Welcome. A very warm welcome to you, Professor. Thank you so much for being here today on the invitation. And I hope we all uh, should learn valuable things from you today. With him, we have uh, our very own leader, an experienced person, Professor Dr. Ruksana Koser. She has a wide experience of uh, academ uh, academic life. She has been in uh, this uh, education sector for the past 32, 35 years. Most of her time she spent in a uh, university, Punjab University, a very famous name. She is an expert psychologist. Let me just give you a brief, uh, quick brief of her profile. Give me one second. OK. So she is, she has uh, uh, done her PhD from University of Surrey, Department of Psychology. And uh, she has also done a post graduation, post doctorate in uh, clinical neuro rehabilitation. An excellent person. She has also been associated with uh, University of Management Technology Lahore recently before joining Government College Women University Sialkot as a vice chancellor. Now, may I please introduce our main guest, our main host? I apologize. The host is Dr. Yasin Munir. Dr. Yasin Munir 
is also is, is also a bonafide student of uh, uh, Professor Dr. Amran. It's an honor to honor for him to actually invite Professor Amran is one of his own session while heading a department in a university with the name of Mr. Mr. Education Department. A true honor for you, Dr. Yasser Marid. May I please invite you to give official opening remarks and then invite Dr. Amran for the due presentation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Yasin Mani. I'll bring you. Dr. please give me one second so that I can bring you live. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Yasin Munir in charge Department of Business Administration, Government College, uh, Women University, Salford. Today, it's great honor for the Department of Business Administration to organize this online lecture series. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is uh, just to provide a platform to the students of MS and PhD where they could see what measures they have to take for writing a good thesis and what they need to do to synthesize their thesis from introduction to conclusion. And most respected guest of honors and other motivation of this lecture was to cater the issue of those students who are unable to complete their thesis within time limit. And even in Pakistan, many PhD scholars are consuming five to seven years to complete their degrees. And today we are lucky enough that we have two great personalities on board to share their experience with our students. I warmly welcome to all of you. Thank you. Over to Thank Shreta. you so much, Dr. Yasin. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Amran, may I please request you to uh, please uh, put on your presentation so that we can see and I can share the screen along with your video. OK, hold on for a while. Yes, sure. Thank you. OK. OK, um, can you guys see my slides? All right. Yes. Uh, Is it coming out? Not at the moment. Yes, let me just share it. Yes, I can see it. OK, good. It has to be on the uh, broadcast. Yeah, yes, we can see it, sir. OK, um, can I begin now? Yes, you may, sir, please. OK, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good morning. I assume it's morning time in in uh, Pakistan. OK, um, I'm, I'm stuck in Malaysia. I can't go back to Zanzibar because of the um, um, lockdown imposed by the government. So um, I think by end of next month, I will be able to return, inshallah. OK. Um, let me share with you some material I prepared um, for this webinar. OK, um, and I'll just go straight to the point. OK, um, the objective is um, I'm focusing more on the first three chapters, OK, because um, based on my experience, um, the professor, first three chapters. Professor, can I, can I please interrupt you? Sorry please. to interrupting you, Professor. Uh, professor, you can see the two layouts uh, on the top of your screen where your presentation is coming, is showing. Please select the split screen layout where you can put on your video as well as the slides as well right in front of you okay um where is this split thing whatever it is um can't seem to find it okay let me check so i mean all right Money okay if you can okay let me give you uh let, give me one second i'll make you mm. Let 
me one second and in the meanwhile uh, please continue in the meanwhile the moment i'll set okay. up the thing i'll let you know please continue with your lecture thank you okay <laughs> sorry for the glitch okay um okay where was i again um okay so let me repeat again um i'm going to focus more on the first three chapters because to me um this is where most of the doctoral students PhD students face problem okay and over in most parts of the world uh, it's called a proposal stage and and once you have finished or passed through the proposal stage only then can you commence with your research your data collection and then proceed to the viva okay um and i don't know whether in pakistan you have this thing called the um the defense oral defense where the candidate will have to uh, present their research to the committee but i'll just add this at the end um to emphasize on the importance of uh, how to prepare for the defense. OK, um, so um, the key question to most um, doctoral students is, are you really ready? OK, is your thesis or is your proposal really ready? OK, um, and, and there are certain important questions that you need to ask yourself okay, before you, um, you go for your submission, before you defend or even you know, at the proposal stage. Uh, the first is um, um, how well defined is your research problem? OK, because um, this is what dictates the novelty of your research. OK, um, and, and sometimes in a defense or even if there's, if there's no defense, if the examiner were to just examine um, the document, the first thing they look for is the novelty of the research. Is it new? Is there any contribution to the body of knowledge and so on? OK. Um, and subsequently, the, the, the student has to propose okay, the importance and the relevance of the research problem, how it impacts society, how it uh, relates to the theories and so on. Okay, and, and therefore, at least the third question, which is uh, what underpinning theories are we ready now? I think I can just proceed without having to, to, to um, ah. see how I look on the screen. Okay. Uh, Professor, you're looking very good, mashallah. Can I actually ask you or request you to send me your presentation on uh, uh, my email, Dr. Yasin, or you can send the, your presentation to Dr. Yasin. I have sent to can Dr. You Yasin already. Okay, I'll, I'll manage you. Please carry on. Thank you. So, okay. please don't disturb. Let him carry on, please. Can I can I go on? Yes, yeah, sure, please. Thank okay, you. sorry for that. OK, so so uh, subsequently the, the underpinning theories, models and empirical studies, OK, how well presented are they? Um, I have examined about 25 PD theses from Pakistan. And, 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 and truthfully speaking, most Pakistani students, they, they have problems with this part. OK, they just present theories, but they do not seem to be able to relate the theories with their research. OK, and there are no supporting models and the empirical studies are not are not solid enough. OK, and subsequently, um, how will a student um, um, apply methodology okay, to to address the research questions? Uh, another issue that I like to point out is that most students, partly from Pakistan, uh, based on my experience, they seem to prefer more of the quantitative methods. OK, it is fine. OK, nothing wrong with it again, but um, for some reason, I think if students were to embark on mixed method uh, or even uh, pure qualitative research, okay, it creates a new dimension okay, um, to the study and sometimes there's more contributory um, perspective okay, instead of just pure quantitative methods. Okay, um, and when the student intend to finish their work, when does the student plan to complete the subsequent components of the thesis? Meaning, um, at the end of the day, I would advise all students to have a gun chart where you present all your critical activities and put in timelines and deliverables and milestones so that this can be your motivation to complete your study on time. Um, I know in Pakistan, it seems like um, it's like a very long process to get a PhD. OK, um, but then again, I think if you have proper time management um, and dedication, you can complete on time. OK. So um, and with regards to the um, problem checklist, OK, there are certain things here that I put in OK, with regards to researchable, originality, OK, contribution and variable, OK? Uh, because at the end of the day, there are many variables in the study. Of course, the dependent variable remains the same, but 
uh, independent variables, moderators, mediators, they can change. OK, so there must be solid reasoning given uh, to, to, to declare the, the independent variable, the moderators and the mediators that you intend to include in your study. If not, um, you know, it doesn't create the impact to the examiners, the readers, OK, and the committee. OK, um, I put this um, in, a, uh, in a slide to show um, the weaknesses of students, OK, because they, they do not seem to have the ability to link up um, the theories to your research, meaning the underpinning theories, and the models to a particular theory, and subsequently um, empirical studies to a particular model. Then it's this cascading effect, OK, that if students were able to present, OK, in their chapter two particularly, it creates a good impression, OK? And, and so um, this is an area I hope students will be able to understand uh, and not just, um, you know, the, the, the problem is for some students, they just they just grab any any empirical study and just put it in your chapter two, OK? Without even linking up with the model, without even linking up with the theories and so on. And sometimes the, the problem is compounded when the students fail um, to to um, discuss or synthesize, okay, whatever empirical studies that they have presented. In life, okay, uh, a student should show, okay, listen carefully, okay, <laughs> it's a bit controversial. Um, a student should show empirical studies which are um, seen as um, supporting um, the model of theories and even some other studies that seems to be not supporting. Many you show both sides, okay? You know, instead of showing everything is positively related, try to find empirical studies that show the reverse. And this makes the research more interesting, okay? So uh, I would like to um, advise, okay, uh, students out there who's listening right now, okay, to, to be more open-minded and, and, and explore empirical studies which are negatively uh, related. OK, and link up with the models and subsequently link the model with the theory and then you have a very sound chapter two. OK, um, here's just an example. OK, this example, I've got um, the dependent variable uh, performance. And I've got um, two mediators. OK, and I've got an independent variable. OK, a good literature review will, will tell the, um, the um, doctoral candidate how to position the constructs properly, OK? Um, is change management more appropriate here or over here? OK, and vice versa, OK? So this is where a good literature review will be able to guide the student uh, as to how to position the constructs and show the interplay among the constructs together, OK? And this will impress the examiner, the reader, and so on, OK? So meaning um, at the end of the day, I put in here also uh, two underpinning theories. OK, the general system theory shows the interplay of three constructs together and the resource based view, OK, which shows the direct relationship. OK, so uh, these two are what I call my underpinning theories. OK, and that uh, will be used um, in chapter two and also towards the end when you when you start your recommendation, conclusion and so on, you have to at the end of the day, relate again with the underpinning theory. Sometimes students, what they do, they just present the theories, but towards the end, they fail to relate again whether your, their studies support, okay, or in a, um, support 100% or indirectly or a certain percentage to the theories mentioned earlier. Okay, and this is important. Is everybody still with me? Clear so far? Am I going too fast? Well, pretty good, sir. No, no, no. Okay, Thank you. Good. Yes. OK, so so no, 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 um, bro, everything is going well. I OK, I'm, I'm worried. My fear is I may be talking at the speed of light, so some people may not be able to follow my presentation. Um, so um, then then the big picture looks into you know, certain questions um, that need to be addressed OK, from the um, problem statement to the literature, to the formulation of the aims and objectives towards the methodology. OK, and, and the elements uh, which are important uh, starts from the identification of the problem all the way leading to how do you interpret the data okay, accordingly. OK, so um, at the introduction stage, OK, uh, to my opinion, the key is how you present the objectives and your research questions. OK, 
and there are several ways to write this as well. OK, the old school, if you observe carefully, the old school will be just a mirror image uh, of the question leading to the objective or vice versa. OK, uh, meaning we have the same numbers here, but the new approach OK, would have a uh, lesser number of objectives because certain questions are combined okay, um, to, to, uh, to make it a bit more impactful. Okay, so students have to have this um, ability, uh, perhaps even uh, better to discuss with the um, supervisors concerned so that whatever they do is always on the right track. Okay, uh, there's no clear cut. Okay, some, some supervisors, some examiners prefer the old school approach, OK, uh, but the more modern ones, they seem to like the more sophisticated approach of consolidating some of the objectives together. OK, um, and then as we move into another area which is often being criticized is the research gaps. The critical question is where is your research gap? OK, so um, and here I put in some indicators on how to find uh, research gaps. Um, whereby students need to carefully read uh, journal papers and look into what are being recommended, okay, or what are the scope that is um, restricting the um, paper written, okay, and also the limitation assumptions and delimitations, okay, because by doing this, then, then you can identify the gaps. Okay, let's say a particular journal talks about a study on motivation um, in, in public um, institutions. OK, and, and he would recommend that further studies be done um, to, to, to explore the same phenomena in a private institution. OK, then this is a research gap. OK, or if the researcher uses a particular method. OK, and then uh, uh, you can also recommend a different method, perhaps which is a bit more comprehensive as another research gap. OK, um, so. Um, sometimes. Um, Students, their problem is they, sorry to say, they, they do not read the whole journal. OK, um, they only read the abstract and then they, they write and uh, they just cut and paste and so on. And towards the end, you do not get quality work. OK, worse would be the case where they don't even bother to read the abstract. They just look at the title and they just create okay, some contents which may not be uh, may not be the, the, the truth. OK. So, so my 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 students, okay, in the past, I will force them to read, okay, and write summaries of um, journal articles and then discuss with me, so that we know they are really reading, and we 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 ask them to be critical to comment on, so they can really find the research gaps, okay. Um, here's an example from a thesis by Shakila. I should I should not mention the name there, okay. It's from a Pakistani university. OK, um, well, you know, um, this is the problem because um, the, the, the gaps are, are very limited here. OK, uh, so I, I would feel the, the candidate can improve further by putting in more um, studies that that are more critical. OK, and even more recent. OK, look. Um, this thesis came to me to uh, to be examined um, early this year, but the references seems to be a bit old. OK, so how can you be critical and identify research gaps when you when you're using references which are more than seven, eight years? OK, so this is another issue and I would want students to read current articles uh, thoroughly. OK, because from there you will find the research gaps properly. OK. Um, then comes this next session called methodology. Um, I, I, I think um, the methodology in preparing your, your sorry, the, your literature. Sorry, okay. Uh, I, I made a mistake. That methodology in preparing the literature. Meaning, uh, it'll be good if students can present chronologically, okay, based on uh, the date of the um, journal paper or whatever article or whatever. Meaning, you start with uh, year 2000, 2001, 2004, all the way to 2019. Meaning, meaning the reader, the reader will be able to see, okay, uh, the flow of the thought on the particular construct. Let's say if your main variable is motivation, 
okay, the evolution of um, studies on, on motivation, if you arrange based on date, okay, uh, chronologically, you can see certain trends. Meaning perhaps in the past, studies on motivation were more uh, intrinsic in nature. But the recent, the recent um, literature indicate that um, the trend is going towards more of the extrinsic factors related to motivation. So this is something that the students must do, not just to present, okay, according to uh, uh, Wong 2010, blah, 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 and so on, according to Abdullah 2017, blah, 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 and so on. You don't, you don't, you don't uh, look into the detail and try to extrapolate where is the trend with regards to this particular construct leading to. And this is a hallmark of a good researcher. Okay. Alternatively, you can you can arrange by themes. Okay. Uh, a theme of uh, motivation studies which are intrinsic in nature. A theme and a thematic analysis on motivation studies which are extrinsic. Another thematic study which shows combination and so on. Okay. So by doing this, you are able to show to the reader uh, you have this ability to group together. Okay. And perhaps towards the end, uh, conclude by, by by indicating which is the dominant theme. This is another problem. Sometimes you write um, your literature, uh, it just stops without any conclusion. Okay. And finally, you can you can discuss, uh, present your your literature based on methodology. Okay. Um, this is not so <laughs> adventurous, I think. Okay. I would prefer the first two, but then again. It's better to have this, okay, instead of just jumbling up, okay, with the proper interpretation, discussion, and being critical, okay. Um, once again, the, the idea is not to just present everything in agreement. Uh, find studies where it's the reverse, okay, it shows that you are being critical as well, okay. It shows that a particular theory has got some weaknesses, a particular model needs to be relooked into, and so on, okay. Um, and towards the end, what you need to do is to prepare a summary table, okay, uh, such as this, okay, uh, and then you group based on themes, okay, this is a study on atmosphere in service environment, okay, um, meaning, meaning um, you, you present, okay, uh, past studies related to a particular theme uh, on color, and these are the, the uh, contents from the particular article on music. We're talking about you know, atmospheric, uh, uh, I mean, the, the environment in a shopping mall. You know, you see colors, you listen to pipe music, you see, uh, the lighting okay, is colorful and so on. Okay, so, so these are the, uh, uh, towards the end, we can, we can identify this as the factors okay, that contribute to the um, service environment. Okay. And you put in a conclusion, okay, so that at the end of the day, uh, at a glance, okay, uh, you can see the big picture, okay, what the study is all about. So, um, okay, then the third section is on methodology, okay. Here's another one. Uh, students like to quote this thing called the research onion, okay. Uh, my 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 take on this is that um, sometimes I feel students they are not adventurous enough. They keep on refer to other people's work past thesis and so on. Okay, and they keep on referring to the old research onion. Okay, uh, with all due respect, okay, the more recent um, research onion came out in 2015, this one here, the bottom one, as compared to this one which came out in um, 2008. If you want to quote the research onion, okay, um, by, by Mark Sander and his colleagues, okay, please use the latest onion, okay? Sorry, I'm not making it like a joke, you know, but then uh, it's, it's obvious you just copy other people's work if you still refer to the old onion, okay? And, and, and my problem is that students, they write um, the methodology section, which is, um, which sounds or reads like a textbook or a software guide, okay? Meaning, once again, okay, you just cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, okay, without discussing, without relating to your research. Okay, you put in a, a section on how to analyze the data. It is like the manual from Amos or PLS. Okay, you have to stop this. Okay, does it make sense? Because um, to people like us, the examiners, okay, it is an insult. Okay, you're not, you're not, sorry, using the language. Okay, you're not um, relating to your studies. Okay, it becomes boring. 
Okay. Okay, um, here again is the old onion. Okay, um, just giving an example. Okay, uh, of a thesis that I've read a year ago. Okay, and and towards the end, okay, I, I put in how how to improve. Once again, in most cases, okay, uh, the the last paragraph or the last few sentences should relate again, okay, to your study. If you discuss epistemology, okay, whatever is on towards the end, should discuss. Uh, what type of epistemology are you using? Is it positivist? Okay, uh, or whatever and so on. Okay, um, so yeah, so you you tie up your 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 sections okay uh, properly so that the reader will know um, what decision have you made accordingly. Okay, okay, um, and then okay the last leg okay uh, of course if you go into the detail. We go to the analysis, okay, which is on the chapter four of the methodology, where, where if you're using um, quantitative methods, you have to be careful, okay. You have to check your data properly to see whether it's normal or not, okay. Um, and then now it seems everybody loves to use PLS, okay. Um, but then again, you have to understand, okay. Um, you have to present the rationale why you're using PLS. It's not just for the sake. Of you know simplicity or convenience, okay. If the data is not normal, then it's appropriate to use PLS. If the sample size is small, then it's appropriate to use PLS, okay. So uh, if if it is an exploratory research, you have to use PLS. So this is an important point. For some reason, uh, some students they would they they replicate past studies, okay, and then they will say I I want to use PLS. No, it's wrong. If you replicate a study that was done before, you have to use EMOS because it's no longer an exploratory study. So these are things that you have to understand. OK, and sometimes the, the, the problem is I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit of tension. I hope you guys don't mind um, when it comes to analysis. Everybody loves to do this moderation, mediation analysis and so on um, to the point. Sometimes I feel it would be good to. To explore fundamental statistics. OK, you can use, still use um single mean analysis okay um meaning univariate analysis to measure the level uh, let's say motivation uh, as a start it will be good to to determine whether the level of motivation is high moderate or low so you might want to use um a single mean t test okay simple mean t test works okay it's very easy to be done and then if you have groups of people Meaning, let's say uh, government versus non-government, then you can do what we call a uh, bivariate analysis. OK, independent sample t-test. OK, um, just to compare between two groups. If you've got more than two groups, you have to use the one way ANOVA. OK, and for all this analysis, you have to test for normality first. Sometimes students, they just do the analysis without testing for the prerequisites. OK, normality, biasness and so on. So, so this has to be done so the analysis is is proper, is tight, is waterproof, OK, and then you will do well. OK, um, so my last uh, presentation is on the um, preparation for the Viva. OK, uh, in, in my part of um, the world, in Malaysia, in Europe, I've taught in Australia and so on, we have the Viva and so on, but we present to the examiners. OK, I don't know in Pakistan, I've ever been involved. Uh, I, I have been involved as an examiner in reading the documents, but I don't know whether there's a viable or not. OK, so. Um, meaning meaning when you want to go for your presentation, make sure you use uh, colorful graphics, OK, uh, short points instead of writing everything on a particular slide. OK, make it short and sweet and, and your ability to present. OK, um, well, having to refer to your notes is a, is a key area that you must master. OK, so um, then let me conclude by talking about start with the end in mind. OK, if you are doing a proposal, start with the proposal defense. If you are now proceeding to the fieldwork, data collection, OK, uh, writing your conclusion, then you start with the end in mind by looking into the graduation process. OK, uh, I would recommend everybody to read this book OK, and apply Stephen Covey's method uh, to achieve uh, effectiveness. OK, I use this a lot in all my activities OK, so the greatest fear is that uh, when the examiner reads or listens to your presentation in their minds, so what? Big deal, OK, meaning there's nothing new with regards to your 
research. OK, and you will you will have big problems later on. OK, um, so the 11 points would be um, you have to have this expert frame of mind. You must be healthy and, and practice your presentation. Um, do some research on your examiners. What do they like and what do they don't like? OK, uh, structure presentation and anticipate difficult questions. Uh, understand the feedback of your supervisor. Uh, understand the requirements by the university and read, reread, read, reread read all over again your thesis. OK, uh, be critical. OK, and then design your presentation carefully and dress for success. OK, um, this is from an article by Jericho in 2016. OK, um, yeah, things to avoid saying I think, I guess, OK, should not happen. When you present, you have to show you are confident and you know the subject matter well enough because you've been researching on this for the past three to four years. OK, um, read a lot, okay? discuss a lot, talk to people and you will be the expert. OK, uh, number two, uh, always be healthy because I've come across the viva where students because of anxiety, they panic, they don't eat, OK, they have stomach cramp and that becomes problematic. OK. Um, practice, you should organize uh, more viva with your colleagues, uh, with your peers, okay? Get your supervisor to be involved as well, okay? This will help you to prepare, okay? Uh, and know your examiners, okay? Um, sometimes it'll be good to um, do some name dropping, okay, of the examiner uh, with regards to your research. Even though it's not in your thesis, but in your presentation, it will impress your examiners, okay? Um, and the format should be as per the requirements of the university. OK, anticipate difficult questions. OK, there will always be difficult questions. OK, tricky questions. OK, if you do not know, just say you do not know. Don't try to maneuver to the point that, you know, uh, people get fed up. OK, so um, get feedback from your supervisors before submission. If he says you're not ready, OK, you better uh, comply accordingly. OK. Um, and towards the end, OK, you have to be critical. OK, uh, come up with good presentation material, dress for success and you will be OK, inshallah. OK, um, so. Um, yeah, if you have a mental block or whatever, OK, um, you just say, OK, let me think about it and I will address your question later on, OK? And then as you go on, you try to think over what could be the answer to the questions posed. OK, OK, with that, I conclude. OK, I don't know whether I've gone beyond the time. OK, seems to be <laughs> a bit lengthy. My apologies. OK, so I will return back to the moderator. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you so thank much, you so uh, much professor. Uh, professor. Thank you. It was excellent. It was excellent. Okay. okay uh, can I please, can I please uh, request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Rukhsana Koster, to please uh, voice her precious inputs or opinion upon today's session and her positive contributions in the light of her experience about how uh, to write a good thesis. Please, ma'am, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Soheb, for inviting me. And before I proceed, in fact, I would like to welcome Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, Dr. Imran to our university platform and uh, offering such a wonderful um, ideas on how to be a successful PhD graduate. Uh, in fact, uh, I have uh, you have covered all the points which I have been experiencing with my students. Uh, my training is from UK, but when I started my training in Pakistan, it was 180 degree um, different. Uh, because when I was studying in UK, I uh, realized that this is my my thesis. My work is my responsibility and I have to own it and I have to work on it and supervisor gives you just feedback and then you have to do it whichever way and supervisor gave me six months only to sit in the library and go through the books and literatures just to conceptualize the idea. Now what I have practiced and what I have seen not practiced or other seen or observed in uh, student uh, now maybe you also experience the same that they want to conceptualize overnight. Uh, they want to prepare their synopsis very quickly um, and they think that this is magic which will happen overnight and that's where you see there is no gap being identified. There is no thorough critical thinking. 
assimilation of knowledge or assimilation of material and synthesis and organizing is not that way so i i see that that there's a problem uh, you know um, dr imran our schooling is like um, doesn't facilitate creative thinking uh, our schooling starts from uh, you know rote kind of memory or rote kind of learning and when we go to a higher level um, i am talking about public sector schools and public sector where mainstream uh, students go and when it gets to the college or the university then we expect that out of blue they will start critical thinking and they will start you know synthesizing material organizing so i we we, we need to think about uh, primary education and then college and then university and change this scenario altogether having said that uh, most of the work uh, comes up with the supervisor who is actually trying to help students uh, you know i have seen my students they are very motivated uh, they want to work they uh, they have lots of potentials they have all that but the techniques which you have said they are missing or we sometimes don't seem to take it seriously and i'm so glad that you have presented all those ideas that how to from conceptualization of the idea to actually um, uh, finishing with the viva techniques that how to make it effective in pakistan we have viva and uh, that is a defense and that is very rigorous and then viva is followed by an uh, sorry uh, defense public defense which is followed by viva so the students have uh, the thesis is uh, supervised and then submitted and then goes to external examiner you are one of those uh, international examiners and also goes to local examiners local examiners come over to take uh, defense and viva so the student has lots of platform where they have to defend their work um, so i am really very pleased to have you and i have seen that you have uh, it gives me an idea that we can conduct more of these kind of workshops for our students um and uh, you know all these topics um, need uh, hours of speaking but you have very tactfully covered them in 45 minutes and i'm so impressed by your uh, expertise and observation you have i have similar observation and i wish you can come more often and spare some time during corona or maybe afterwards and may physically visit us when this situation uh, resolves and i'm so very thankful to my team um, um dr Uh, our head of the department, uh, Dr. Munir, who has uh, been your uh, supervisor, or maybe you are his thesis examiner. So bringing you here, linking you with us, and our students learning from you. And I'm I'm happy that our students have uh, over 457 people have been attending, and I expected more. Inshallah, we will have more in in the future. And uh, Soheb and Aliza. and all the rest of the team who has been organizing it thank you very much indeed and god bless you thank you so much respected ma'am very well concluded and very well said professor amran has really done it for us uh, i also want to congratulate professor amran for his conciseness and his uh, uh, immense knowledge has been actually very well uh, comprehensively communicated to our students and our on self as well may i please ask uh, the students that they can actually uh, now ask questions as well uh, with your permission professor imran can we start the question answer session please Are there any questions? Yes, Professor. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. I'm starting the question answer sessions. I have just made an announcement. Okay. To the students, that they can ask questions from you, please. As soon as uh, they will ask a question, and I'll make it pop out. so that you can actually see okay, can I, what the question is can i can ask a question on behalf of students um, you yes. discussed about quantitative Please. and qualitative studies and mixed method if if uh, a student has uh, a number of series of studies how do they actually uh, put it in their thesis because sometimes uh, what students do is that uh, methodology chapter 
and then study one method, study two method, and study three method, which makes it very confusing. Mm-hmm. Then they move into results section. So because you have lots of experience, can you with mixed method? Okay. Uh, can you just explain how to put it in the thesis? Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, um, how do I start? Okay. Um, it all depends on on your on your research questions. Okay. So if you have research question number one, okay, uh, what is the level of motivation? That is a quantitative question. Okay. Question number two, how do you relate uh, motivation with satisfaction? Another quantitative question requiring quantitative method. But then if your question number three uh, looks into how can we improve the motivation level of employees in a particular department? Okay. The moment you have this how type of questions, it becomes a qualitative question, which would require qualitative methods. Okay, it could be based on observation, it could be based on interview, it could be based on document review, and so on. Okay, or combination of all this. Okay. Um, the next issue is uh, how do I go about? Okay, in my uh, conduct of research. Should I start with the quantitative method first or qualitative first or both in parallel? Okay, meaning yes, it's, 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 it's up it, to you. Yeah, yes. it's up to you. You want to do it yeah. sequentially or concurrent, but all this has to be explained in your methodology because for some reason, okay, um, I, I, I like their work by Creswell because they promote the concept of sequential, meaning you start with one method first and then you move on to the next method. Because by doing so, it creates a richer uh, form of analysis, meaning the first method will guide the subsequent method. Let's say the first set of quantitative methods, okay, uh, looks into correlation and measuring the level, and from there on, you find certain critical findings, okay, that you want to go deeper, and then it makes you know the qualitative method even more, uh, even better because it, it goes deeper into the subject matter instead of just touching the surface. OK, so so these are things that uh, students must understand properly uh, when when uh, desiring to embark on a mixed method approach in their in their in their research. OK. Is that clear enough? Thank you. Yeah, so sequential okay. would be preferable. Mm. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, do we have okay students? You can actually and all the participants, you can uh, please write your questions in uh, the QA uh, live option shown. You can actually ask a question. You can type it over there, and I can forward the question and make it visible on the screen so that professor can answer your question. OK, Professor, we have one question with us. OK, good. OK, they are asking that what should be the uh, typical length of a good thesis? For example, how many uh, word counts it should hold? What is the maximum size? Does it have to be a very big, hefty book? Or uh, <laughs> what, are, what is the best practices in the world? OK, um, OK. <laughs> OK. So question that, that um, I have to answer carefully, OK, because um, I did my PhD in Denmark, OK, um, and the Danish, they are, they are very practical people, OK? So when, when I completed my, my research, I asked my supervisor, um, how many pages should I write? You know? And his answer was uh, very simple. <laughs> um, it's not a matter of uh, quality or quantity. What concerns us is the quality, OK? Meaning even if you write uh, 150 pages, but it's a very uh, thoroughly written, okay, uh, the quality is good. It's better than to have 300 or 400 pages, okay, of which you're writing, okay, um, things which are not related, beating around the bush unnecessarily and so on. Sorry, I'm using the, the analogy, okay. Uh, but then again, there are some universities, okay. Um, I did my master's in America, okay, uh, for my thesis. There's a requirement on minimum number of pages and words. OK, so my advice to students is to always check with the graduate office. Is there a requirement in terms of pages, numbers of words and so on? 
is the requirement on formatting, okay, because the format would would uh, have impact on a number of pages as well. Is it going to be double space or one half spacing fonts and so on? Okay, this this will also inevitably have impact on a number of pages. So students should be smart. Okay, uh, look into the system, understand the requirement first. Okay, before doing any submission. Uh, my my friendly advice, I'm going a bit off tangent now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and before submission, please proofread your work. Okay, I have so much headaches. Okay, reading uh, theses which are written in a very haphazard manner. Okay, and, and it's a shame because some for some theses the research is good, but because the quality of writing is bad, okay, it has impacted their chances to proceed at the highest level. Okay, so my friendly advice: please proofread. Get somebody good to prove it. Don't just get your friends. Sometimes, you know, I'm sorry, okay, I'm, <laughs> I have to apologize. There's this, this British um, proverb, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you are penny wise by, but pound foolish. You want to save money, okay, so you ask your friend to prove it. And then, you know, the quality, it will be suspected. So, so um, but then again, if, if you can't afford, you can, you can use software. OK, there are some softwares OK um, that you can apply to improve on the quality of your writing. Then then the chances of you getting better grades will be enhanced, inshallah. OK, very well said. Thank you so much. Very well said. Dr. Yasin Muni, you are also requested to ask uh, students in the closed group to if, if they have any question, they might not be actually finding the Q&A option. Probably this is the first time Dr. Professor, we are actually uh, broadcasting this through our MS teams. Dr. Yasimuni, if you can hear me, you can also ask questions on the behalf of your students. They might have sending you in your WhatsApp as well. Actually, uh, question session, uh, question answer session is uh, not looking here. Uh, the interface uh, which I am looking, uh, uh, the question session is not here. So I behalf. On, uh, I think they can, they, can, uh, Munir, they can be urged to ask on chat. There is chat on the side. Uh, chat, uh, they can write their question on chat instead of question answer. Uh, I think this can be another option. Yes, uh, this is the option. Where is? Uh, let me reach chat. Chat on the left. There is a bar uh, which uh, says chat. And I could see the chats of people saying uh, we can't hear uh, Dr. Nashiva saying I can't hear Dr. Khalil said I can't enter. So I think we should be mindful about these chats which are going on on the site to help them. So students can add or anybody can ask their question there in chat. Swap sir, please uh, uh, let the others to ask. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I search where should I? So you can you can you can directly I ask you. You. I got yes okay so we actually, have more questions yeah. for you professor okay. yeah actually both the personalities have discussed amazingly and there is i think uh, no need to further ask uh, up to myself there is no need to ask any question but if students have there any question they can ask so, okay. okay. Thank you, Doctor. We are having questions. G. Can I ask, please? Go ahead. All right, Professor. Uh, the first question I'm having from uh, Miss Aisha, and she's asking: Is it possible to include the population and samples from two countries in thesis work? Because currently I'm working some on something like that. OK, OK, can I can I answer this, please? OK, um, um, Sister Aisha, uh, very good question. OK, um, OK, here's the issue now. OK, um, if you are using uh, population as the base for your study, um, truthfully speaking, uh, number one is going to be very difficult. OK, unless unless if it is a census data, meaning data of the population in a, uh, which has already been collected. OK, but 
the, the, the main problem with census data or population data is that once you have a population, you cannot do any inferential statistics. Listen carefully, yeah? My first degree was statistics, so I, I learned all this. Okay. <laughs> uh, some students they say, I want to use population data. I say, well, if you use population data, you're going to have problems because you cannot have hypothesis. You cannot build any influential analysis. Okay, you can only report, report things descriptively. Okay, so, um, so my advice, okay, even if you are talking about uh, population data from two countries, okay, you better be careful. But then again, if it is uh, something that cannot be avoided, let's say you're looking at a population from two, um, let's say two companies, okay? Um, and these two companies are located in different countries and the number of employees in these two companies are very small. So it becomes a population study, like it or not, okay? Um, so how do we circumvent this? Okay, my advice is, that's why you have to understand the concept of sampling methodology. Sampling methodology. Listen carefully, Sister Aisha. Um, sometimes you, you might want, because without any uh, hypothesis, it's going to be difficult to, to organize your, 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 your findings session. Uh, you, you might want to treat this small population to still be uh, a sample by using the Stephen Call. Um, um, uh, multi-level sample selection, meaning meaning you do some kind of a stratified sampling. You start off by looking into the population of all companies and towards the end you stratify and you choose these two companies. Company A to present, uh, represent uh, country A and company B to represent country B. Okay, so by doing this, since this is now stratified, okay, it qualifies for you to do uh, to develop hypothesis and come up with inferential analysis. Okay, so so uh, I would I would um, suggest Sister Aisha to read carefully uh, books on sampling methodology. Don't just read books by Sekeren; it's not good enough. Okay, as a PhD student, you should read the more the high level books. Okay, on research methods. To me, the second book, I'm sorry, I'm being critical. Okay? The second book is only appropriate for the master's degree. But once you embark on a PhD, you have to you read the higher level um, research methodology books that, that specializes on a particular topic, on sampling, okay, on methodology analysis and so on. Okay, I hope I'm able to answer the question by Sister Aisha once again. Uh, if, if, you're still, uh, if you still treat the population, uh, as is, then you can only do descriptive analysis. But if you were to do multi-level sampling methodology such as stratify or cluster, whatever, then you can treat these two uh, samples to represent two different countries, then you, you can still do the um, hypothesis and have inferential analysis, then it becomes a bit easier, inshallah. Thank you, sir. Professor, thank you. May I may I ask uh, yes, please, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Uh, I think there is some echo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Soheb. Uh, actually, and uh, Dr. Safar, uh, talking from population perspective, I would like to uh, add from logistic point of view. Uh, if you want to do some cross-cultural research and you have some rationale to do that, uh, then you have to have uh, some somebody as a collaborator on the other end to help you in the process because you can't travel all the way to collect the data. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, in social sciences, I'm sure we mainly the thrust of today's presentation is on social sciences. And what happens is that in social sciences, you have quite rigorous protocols of getting yes. ethical approvals from uh, both sides because your population is humans and you um, will have a rigorous process to follow. Uh, three, you might have uh, to uh, meet all those requirements which the other country wants you to uh, in order to collect data uh, because we uh, want our students and we want our uh, researchers to be very, very ethical and follow all those, those ethical standards to conduct research. And even if you have gathered data without, um, I mean, from the sample from another country, 
uh, or in any country for that matter in informal way when you go to publishing there would be an issue because they would ask you ethical approvals of the committees mm-hmm. and then there is an issue related to that too so we don't uh, urge anybody unless their supervisors uh, have a collaboration with a counterpart professor who covers them at the other end from for these kind of logistic and practical issues so this is my addition to this cross cultural um, and gathering data from two countries thank you yeah Good point, Thank Ray. you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay, Professor, we have some more questions with us. Allow me to ask a couple of more questions sent by the students. Good. And uh, the next question is, one of the students anonymously asked that how to, how should I can remove plagiarism in the thesis? Hmm. Plagiarism. Or uh, how should we deal? Huh? Actually, the plagiarism issue is very big issue. And how do, how can we deal with the plagiarism okay. while writing such thesis? Okay, um, I'll start with this. I'm sure uh, Prof. Ruxana has got many views on this as well. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, plagiarism can be easily detected. Okay, we've got softwares like Turnitin, whatever. And, and in reality, you cannot avoid okay um, plagiarism because even as you run. The software, there'll be some values coming out. Many can have zero value coming out for similarity index. For this reason, uh, universities uh, have this uh, tolerance. Okay, if if the um, similarity index goes beyond 20%, then they will say that you have to do some uh, rework on your thesis. So this is where this is where the students must have skills in writing to avoid plagiarism. Okay. Uh, this is where you should not be doing cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. It doesn't make sense. OK, uh, and there are there are tools that can guide you on how to paraphrase. OK, how to paraphrase so that uh, the context of the sentence is not 100 uh, percent as per how it was written in the journals. OK, so so uh, and, and this is an art students have to master. And that's why I would always recommend my students the moment after you read a particular journal paper, throw away the paper and write using your own words. Write using your own, except for the, the, the statistics, yes, but the content write using your own words. And this this will be the best way to overcome plagiarism. OK, so uh, cannot say much Okay, other than to always practice your writing skills so that um, uh, your 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 um, thesis will be of high quality uh, with a lower percentage in terms of similarity index, inshallah. Professor Sana, maybe you've got experience <laughs> on this. <laughs> no, thank you, because I know the this side of story, so that's why I want to add. Uh, <laughs> actually, if that's that's true. That paraphrasing, and there are um, when I joined uh, my PhD, they got all these uh, workshops for us and lectures for us, yeah. how to paraphrase, how to write mm-hmm. references, and how to not consider that while you are paraphrasing, it doesn't become your work. It has still you have to uh, give <laughs> references and citations. Exactly. So, uh, you know, sometimes um, students perceive that if they have paraphrased and written their own words, it means it's their idea. That is not true. Mm. So they, 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 they don't give references when they don't give references or give number of references for that matter. They might read n number of uh, sources, but then assimilate that material in their own um, style and then give n number of references where they have got yeah. that material. Uh, actually, the reader and writer, actually it's writer's style which would reflect. When you copy paste, you will copy paste one abstract and as you were rightly saying that student don't read. I mean, we were. I myself was in one point doing the same exercise, and then learned how to get away with it. Uh, the copy pasting, copy pasting abstracts, right? And the st- it reflects that it's not the writer who is putting this thesis um, in place. It's somebody else, one style, other style, third style. So that is actually actually writing style also matters if you don't write your way. And if you not assimilate work and then produce it meaningfully. Uh, number two, sometimes students, what what do they do is there is a software which checks plagiarism, but there is another software which fixes uh, plagiarism. So now what happens is I have a 
experienced my students the work was wonderful i approved it plagiarism became 24 25 whatever above the threshold value they ran that through material through that software and it became all hodgepodge you know so the plagiarism uh, i i don't know what that software is and and then i came to know what is happening the the previous draft was different and meaningful but when they Uh, submitted after reducing the plagiarism it was something which was like neologism kind of thing you can't even read you can't even make sense ke what but plagiarism was zero or 5% so you know you have to do everything in a wisely man- manner and please uh, you if you want to experiment such kind of thing keep a copy of your previous draft which which your supervisor has checked and then mm-hmm. r- run these kind of experimentation because otherwise you will be in a complete chaos to restore your work which was previously meaningful uh, and i can understand you have to acquire those skills to reproduce whatever you read yourself and then there uh, i'm sure plagiarism is not a bigger issue so you shouldn't be worried about plagiarism provided you are not stealing somebody's data or copying some thesis or borrowing from somewhere else and producing as your own work which on which is unethical in any way so plagiarism and ethics go side by side and number 2 you have to have a skills to reproduce your work so as uh, said by dr imran thank you thank you madam uh, pro uh, i have one question uh, prof can you uh, guide us our students uh, how can they select uh, a good topic for uh, their thesis that uh, an emerging topic i mean hmm. Okay um let me start first okay um a good topic would be something um which is current okay um let's say this a uh, covid-19 pandemic is current so you do something based on this okay would be very good it would be very interesting and everybody would like reading this okay it's not like reading something that they can anticipate what's going to be the results okay um if you write something on the financial crisis of 19 1990 that would not be good because it's about 30 years old and there's about 2500 theses on the asian contagion effect of financial collapse so there'll be something you do not want to write on so i think the the key is um if you want to find a good topic it has to be current it has to be interesting okay um sometimes to some extent um controversial okay um issues could also be studied but you have to be careful okay uh, i had one students who, who wrote about corruption and it became a big issue okay <laughs> so so and i told the student to tone down the content because you know um yeah yeah of course we want to report academic truth okay but you know uh, you have to protect the identity of people organization places and so on okay so you have to use codes and so on uh, so that it doesn't become too obvious so so um my advice okay um to students is to read a lot discuss a lot with your supervisors they may have some ideas on what would be a good topic okay example yeah I'll give you an example let's say you want to do something on entrepreneurship you know there's a thousand and one studies millions and millions you just click on entrepreneurship millions of studies done really big deal but then if you want to focus make your scope a bit uh, specialized you focus on what we call techno entrepreneurs okay and then entrepreneurs who use technology as their platform or it entrepreneurs they will be a bit more they'll be a bit more exciting okay it's a plain generic entrepreneurship okay so so students uh, should should know this uh and and should look into a smaller scope which is emerging that that will create okay excitement and it becomes easier for you to contribute to the body of knowledge if you do something which is green field than something of the meal that has been done over and over again my point of view maybe yeah this can can put as well thank you bro yeah Uh, another problem is uh, when they write yeah yeah carry on that is asin manish yeah uh, 
Prof, another problem is when they write problem statement, they mix uh, significance of the study with a problem statement and implications in problem statement. How can they differentiate problem statement from uh, significance and uh, implication of research? And I okay. have uh, personally seen many theses where they just mixed up problem yeah. statement, significance yeah. of the study, and implication of the study. How can they differentiate these three points? Thank you, Bro. Okay. Um, okay, let me get this right. Okay, the, the difference between um, the problem statement, um, the significance of the study, and the implications. Okay. Um, let me start backward. Okay, when we talk about implication of studies, basically uh, you can relate with practical implication. How your study can be used, okay, um, uh, to be applied practically, okay, to, to the organization, to the government, whatever, and so on. Okay, or number two, it can be implicated from the um, theoretical perspective. Okay, how the study will be seen um to support the theory or challenge a particular theory which is even better if you can challenge the theory it will be even more exciting okay and number three uh, from the methodological perspective uh, meaning how how your study implicates methodology okay meaning uh, if if many studies have been done uh, by using a particular method using a particular instrument okay um then then you might want to to show how your study uh, challenges whatever assumptions given in the past. Okay, so that new methods, um, new tools, okay, uh, new methods of analysis and so on uh, can be applied to accordingly. Okay, um, going backward, the next issue on the significance, the significance should always relate to research gaps. Okay, so uh, meaning at the end of the day, uh, you should show that your research is fulfilling uh, research gaps uh, mentioned by previous authors, previous literatures, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, sometimes there's a thin line of demarcation between significance and implication, but but to me, uh, the significance should always relate to the research gap. Okay. Then finally, um, is the uh, statement of the problem. This should relate to the burning issues. Okay. Uh, meaning you should show that this research you're doing is current, okay, um, it has a niche, um, and um, it relates to the general problem phase, okay, it has got uh, certain economical or political ramification as well and so on, okay. So uh, to summary, um, the the uh, statement of problem should have burning issues. OK, you can put in statistics to support if you're saying that uh, many, many uh, people are now disillusioned or depressed because of COVID-19. You come up with some data, OK, and that becomes uh, the significance. Oh, sorry, the, the, the problem statement. You provide statistics to support your claim. OK, so uh, some background information should be there to show that, hey, this is a very important issue to focus on because of national interest, okay, political uh, implications and so on, okay? And the other one is significance related with gaps, okay? And the third one implications has got three, okay, um, methodological, um, theoretical, and practical implications. I think. <laughs> I may be wrong, okay? Yeah. Thank you so much. We have another question. And uh, the student is allow asking Professor now. Professor Rosana to respond also. I know she's got lots to comment no, no, no. on. It's, it's perfectly, perfectly. I am. All right. So, uh, ma'am, you're always welcome to uh, provide your input wherever you feel like. You're more than welcome. I okay, know Professor. You can tell you. I, thank you, ma'am. Okay, one more uh, question for you, Professor. The student is asking now that can we use IPA for data analysis while employing grounded theory? The interrupted phenomenal analysis. OK, OK, OK. Yeah, OK, um, this uh, we are now going into qualitative methods, OK, grounded theories and I, I um, 
IP and so on. Um, so um, I, I, I should think so, okay, because um, this is an area which is rarely studied and it should be exciting, okay, uh, and because it's all um, deductive at the end of the day um, and towards the end, uh, you, you, you know, the difference between qualitative and quantitative methods, to my opinion, if you read works by um, Baldwin, no, sorry, um, Miles and Huberman, um, Miles and Huberman, if anybody is doing qualitative method, you should read the work of Miles and Huberman. Then it becomes a bit easier to understand uh, the fundamentals, okay? So, um, so because this grounded theories and so on, towards the end, you will be able, as per what has been proposed by Miles and Huberman. Towards the end, and only then can you come up with the conceptual framework. Okay, this is where the reverse of this quantitative method. The quantitative method has got the, the, the conceptual framework up early. At the end of your chapter two, after your literature, you propose your framework. Okay, based on your, your, your views on the interplay of the constructs. This is my framework done. But, but when you do grounded theory, there's no framework to guide you. The framework comes towards the end. Okay, and this way I feel this IFA phenomenon analysis, okay, uh, can be used concurrently to guide the student, okay, in their qualitative analysis. All right. Thank you so much, Professor. I hope this uh, satisfies as a very good answer to the question. OK, uh, next question is uh, uh, very interesting, rather, I would say. Uh, the student, uh, Ms. Faiza, the Ms. Faiza is asking that how many number of research papers typically we have to read to form up or to actually start working upon a thesis because the first chapter of a thesis is very important. So what do you suggest? I mean, should we go for a typical number? We set a benchmark and then we uh, find out 20 or 15 or 30 research papers and then go through it to form a line, to formalize and start the first chapter uh, of the thesis. How can we do that? I mean, is there a benchmark or we just keep <laughs> on reading and finding relevant information? OK, uh, let me let me kick start this first, OK? Um, once again, it's the issue of quality versus quantity, number one, OK? Uh, always refer to quality documentation. Um, always refer to um, publication from uh, minimum scopus index journal or journals with impact factors. Those would be superb, OK? Don't don't refer to Internet articles, you know, which are I don't know, you know, in some of these fly by night journal operators that, you know, whatever you send gets published. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Um, so, um, how many? Okay, Miss um, Faiza, sister, okay, listen. Um, your, your job is to, to read as many as possible to tell you the truth, but you have to work smart, okay? Uh, that's why, you know, I'm fortunate because I was trained by the Danish. Like, let me share with you some trick of the trades. You know, in Denmark, when we work on our PhD, we can start anywhere based on where you feel you're good at. And when I did my PhD, I started off in chapter two, in chapter two, okay, the literature. And then from there on, I go to back to chapter one, put in some information which I think is very, very basic introduction type, you know, and push it back to chapter one. And then from there on, okay, identify, I identify, I'm able to identify instruments used by most of the authors, and I put those instruments in my chapter three. Okay, meaning if you write, you can crisscross from one chapter to the next and so on. Even when you're at the last stage of doing your conclusion, you might come across new literature that you want, you might want to put in, okay, or, you know, or replace whatever that, that could be seen as questionable, okay, in terms of validity and reliability, okay? So, so um, unfortunately, okay, Sister Faiza, there's no clear-cut number. It's a quality game, okay? Uh, and your job is to read as many as possible and, and keep track, okay, of the, uh, the content of whatever you read, okay? And look for quality journals, 
Let me tell you why. Okay, in this modern era, there are some examiners. I'm one of them. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the moment I, I receive a thesis, I will start backward. I will look into the references first. How many references? And number two, how old are the references? And number three, how good are the journals being referred? You should look into the three questions and you will find uh, quality documentation. OK, they can support your thesis, inshallah. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor. I will, Thank you so much. Yeah. I would like yes, to add a bit. Uh, actually, um, he has comprehensively covered uh, what a student should do. But what I recommend to my students now is that you uh, start from the recent research, uh, like uh, review articles. Get some review, uh, literature review articles, which is meta analysis or anything, because they have covered comprehensively. And of course, they are good journal, uh, either impact factor or in a reputed journal. Um, and then you will get um, the rest of the references underneath those, and you will have a idea how to go about it. I, as students sometimes find it difficult, what is related and relevant to their work? Because uh, related and relevance is uh, um, kind of a uh, tricky question because they think that if they are working on stress in caregivers of uh, schizophrenic patients, then they would be very focused to look at only them. So when they find it really difficult or they, they say okay, there is not much research, I'm just giving an example, there would be so much on caregivers of schizophrenia, uh, but then they, they, they just focus, they have very, very narrow approach they would just focus and say there is no, not much research on that. You may look at stress of caregivers in other conditions, of course, as a, mm -hmm. um, a relevant literature. So um, it must be recent, as Dr. Sub has already said. Uh, it must be comprehensive and related to your work, what you want to. And number three, the journal should be good quality. Uh, of course, there is no comprehensive. We can't say you 100 articles you should study. Yes, sometime uh, at BS level or at MSc level, uh, I would ask my students at least come read a full and uh, 10 full length articles uh, which are relevant uh, because they don't read at all. So uh, I at least making them to read at least 10. But it doesn't mean that when you are writing your thesis at PhD level, you have a number game or at MPhil level for that matter too, that you don't have number. You just have to establish recent, uh, recently updated work uh, the quality works you have quoted and the relevant you have covered it properly. Thank you. Excellently put, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right. So next we have a couple of more questions, Professor and uh, uh, Madam, please. Uh, it's about references. The student has uh, anonymously asked that is it possible to add information we came to know through local resources or personnel which actually do not have any refer references. Like if we add to, if we, if we want to add someone's own experience. So can we do that in the thesis? And additionally, she asked that, can we take references from old papers which has been published uh, prior to 1980? Okay. Okay, um, references, okay. Um... Bismillah. Okay. Um, when we talk about local resources, um, experience-based references based on discussions, um, the first one's again, um, everything relates to quality. Okay. So if 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 you want to put in um, a reference based on a discussion you have with a with somebody. And you put it in in your thesis. It's okay, actually. In my old university, they say it's okay. But number one, you have to make sure that this person, okay, um, has the credentials. Okay, um, it could be in terms of competency. It could be based on experience, um, academic uh, positions, and so on. And therefore, whatever he or she she says. OK, um, will have some importance bearing. OK, you cannot just be referring to any Tom, Dick and Harry and just say, oh, according to, and then you have to give quotes. OK, Mr. A or Professor Y or whatever and so on. OK, and put in a small footnote, OK, uh, based on a discussion. 
it should not be in the in the reference okay because reference uh, has got something which is structured okay you can put it in a footnote saying this is based on discussion with professor x dated whatever whatever and so on okay and that's enough okay so uh, that is if you if your reference is based on experience uh, discussion uh, of, of people with no proper citation possibility uh, the second issue is on old papers and so on. Okay, this I've got issues. Okay, so um, to me, newspapers are uh, uh, not to be relied on 100%. Okay, because in, a, in, a, in most parts of the world, okay, uh, newspapers um, sometimes the 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 authenticity of their claim is questionable. Okay. So you have to be careful on this. Um, and furthermore, uh, what's more damaging if the article from the paper does not have an author. It's just a column with no you know, proper name to be based on. That's even more tricky. So if you want to refer to newspapers, look for those where, where you can identify uh, with the uh, author or editor. Sometimes there are sections called okay, the thoughts of the editor. His name is there. Uh, those will be a good source, but it's just a paper uh, cutting, you know, describing an event. OK, um, then I would not use that as a reference because it, it, it has questionable doubts in terms of quality. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Professor, uh, if, if uh, Madam Professor Roxana, if you don't have any other additional point, can I move on to the next question, please? Yes, sure. Please move on. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, the co next question is uh, uh, from Miss Arusa, uh, Sister Arusa. She is asking that how to report the results effectively. And we all know that that novelty is one of the biggest. I mean, issue or uh, uh, we need to have the novelty of the idea as well. So please do let us know how to report the results effectively and for the novelty of idea. Do we have a, a, a software or a mechanism available or it is just a, a search, uh, typical search methods that we do, uh, we put on the Google Scholars and many other platforms available to check the novelty of the idea? Hmm. This is a very complicated question actually. <laughs> How to report results effectively to, to show novelty? Wow. OK, OK, let me, let me try to break it down to pieces first, OK? Um, number one, when you report your results, um, um, I would suggest I would suggest you you report based on. Okay, this is my style as per what I learned in Denmark from my from my supervisor. Okay, it's got a very a unique mechanism to to organize the results. Okay, reporting of the results. So normally we when we, when you're presenting the results, number one you present the 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 descriptive analysis, the basic demography first. OK, um, and then number two, you, you present the results whether all the assumptions have been fulfilled. If you're doing statistical analysis, OK, uh, have all the assumptions been fulfilled? And then number three, uh, has all the um, evidence of um, validity and reliability has been presented? OK, because without this, you cannot proceed. OK, if you're doing analysis, uh, how do we know is is reliable, uh, reliable? How do we know whether there's biasness or not? So all these have to be presented, and these are what I call the preliminary results. Okay, and then once you're done with this, you move on into the uh, the more detailed one, which addresses to your research questions. Okay, so you should present your results as per the research question. Let's say research question number one is on um, the level, the level of motivation, as I've spoken before. OK, so you present the results on the level of motivation, the single mean t test, OK, uh, and, and you show which which hypotheses are being supported and so on and full stop. <clears throat> Don't extrapolate. In the findings, you only present the results. To discuss, you, you do that in the final chapter. OK, then you address the next research question, um, the interplay, the correlation. You come up with your correlation matrix, whatever and so on. If you've got more relators and meters, then you go into the um, structure equation modeling, okay, and so on and so on and so on, okay, and present the uh, the significant and the non-significant findings. Full stop. 
Okay. Um, so the issue of novelty to me should not be discussed in the results. It can be discussed again, of course, in the first chapter and again in the final chapter. You re-emphasize, yes, the novelty is here. Okay, am I finding support? My claim of novelty earlier in my chapter one. Okay, so that's why I said towards the end, um, um, this is an art. Okay, writing a thesis is an art. Uh, you should not be saying, oh, I do not have competency in, in English or whatever. I do not do well in my English. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, if you practice hard, if you write continuously every day, two, three pages, um, you check and recheck, okay, um, use some uh, paraphrasing tools and so on, then, then you will improve, okay? It's a, it's a skill that has to be acquired. And there's no shortcut, I'm sorry, okay? Um, practice makes perfect, okay? So to conclude, the novelty comes up in chapter one and also in the last chapter where you show that um, the, the, the significant findings, yes, support your claim of novelty that you have put earlier in your chapter one. Then you're done, you're safe. Yeah, thank you. I would like to add a bit. I'm sure you have comprehensively covered it. Um, novelty, as you said, is uh, identifying gaps and what is new um, in your work. If you are not replicating somebody's work as it is, or if, even if you are replicating uh, what you are doing new to it. Uh, so novelty is not established in results. It has to be an introduction. And then coming back to discussion, relating with introduction uh, and literature chapter and seeing that how novel your findings are. Uh, analysis, I would like to add that um, he has covered it uh, starting from um, presumptions and then stating, uh, analyzing and then reporting and then concluding. But I would also um, ask my students to give summary of the findings at the uh, end of the analysis results chapter. Because then, uh, for example, if they have done analysis correlation for one hypothesis one, so what was the major finding? So they summarize the findings. And then when they move on to discussion, they pick on those findings uh, and yes. discuss them. Then it becomes more structured um, mm -hmm. because I have seen people to repeating introduction again in discussion without uh, referring back to their findings and what is there. So it's actually a rewriting introduction and literature again in discussion. So I found it very hard way to uh, guide my students. So please <laughs> summarize your results, uh, whatever your analysis is, be it your qualitative, be it be your quantitative, so summarize those findings and then take those findings one by one and look into how do you relate them to the existing literature and also offer cultural uh, explanation from cultural uh, perspective or why uh, this is in line with your existing, why the hypothesis has been supported. If supported, it doesn't mean it's okay, good. If not supported, even then you have to discuss. So, you know, some one misconception students have is that if your hypothesis is supported, then you move on taking that um, finding in discussion. If it doesn't, then you just forget it. So even if a hypothesis is not supported, uh, Dr. Um, Sub has already said that even challenging the new theory, so your findings are different from what n number of authors had been demonstrating in the past. So if your finding or your, your research has found that hypothesis is not supported or your research question has been otherwise, but it, the findings are other way around, so you have to discuss them even more because they are more more important and they are paving the way to a new directions and a new research in future. So I wonder that uh, I, I um, think he has covered um, uh, very um, amicably, but I would like in this way that don't think that results are the ones which would support definitely your hypothesis because when you go into those mind frames, sometimes people start to fabricate their uh, data in order to support their hypothesis, which is not good practice because then even your hypothesis is not supported doesn't mean that it's not useful research. Uh, there is a school of thought which says that though the, the research journals don't publish um, non-significant findings or non-significant you know, so that is another question, but um, you, if you have done your research in a proper manner, your methodology was flawless. Of course, it can't be flawless completely in social sciences, but if you have taken care of all the covariates, if you have, your methodology was very rigorous and your procedure was, uh, you made sure that your data analysis was in a very standard way. And if you have analyzed with the rationale and of course assumptions being met, um, you don't have to worry about your results because your results would be 
based on relevant data and what direction they will be giving they will be helping the your successor and yourself in maybe postdoc and future research giving, giving you direction to move on that way so that's what i have to add thank you oh excellent point i want i want to write on that please if you don't mind very true do not be afraid to report any hypothesis that fail to be proven okay i've seen a thesis okay um uh not my thesis but i downloaded a thesis from i can't remember it was it was a good university in america by a korean researcher out of something like 20 20 hypotheses he's only got 10 which were supported <laughs> only 10 but he reported everything as per what uh, he had uncovered and he explained okay why some of his hypotheses uh, could not be supported okay he did not claim a bias whatever but you know he explained from the cultural perspectives and so on which was very good you know so please do not fabricate your results okay uh, now let me let me advise students okay some universities now what they do they ask students to bring their data and run the analysis just to double and triple check and they found out they are cheating that's it okay it's going to be history so report the truth don't try to manipulate you get yourself into bigger trouble it's not worth it thank you dr Luzana. thank you good so, point thank yeah you. thank you so much thank you so much professor and uh, i would like to break a news for you professor Am amran is having a is having a scheduled meeting in next five six minutes <laughs> so just to uh, i'm sorry just to very quickly wrap it yes being a vice chancellor we can truly understand your busy schedule sir uh if we if you can just quickly give a uh, last answer to a question and then we can carry on uh, the first question, further question and answering session maybe with the help of uh, madam uh, vice chancellor if she is available further yeah. uh, it is about uh, the percentage of uh, research research mentioning for example if you are uh, mentioning a research you're doing a cross cultural research uh, between so, for example social media addiction between pakistan and europe so what kind of the percentage of uh, research that you should add into your uh, uh, thesis or findings it should it has to be 50 50 balanced or what what percentage is more prone toward should it has to be if i am a pakistani original origin so should i keep a higher percentage for pakistani uh, research references or for the europe one which i'm comparing okay. with okay um okay um to me i may be wrong okay but this is okay i'm putting on my my logical mind okay um, if you do a comparison on, on social media, whatever, between country A and country B, uh, how I would start is by looking which country, listen carefully, has got a bigger number of population who are engaged in social media. Okay? Percentage, not population number, percentage. Okay? And this will tell us which is more dominant as compared to the other. So therefore, if I want to do a percentage of research mentioning as what was raised by um, the, the, the the student or whoever okay i start off by looking into the uh, percentage of population who are engaged in social media for these two countries the one with the higher percentage will be the one that i have more weightage for as compared to the other okay once again i'm using my logical mind to address to this uh, question <laughs> thank you so much Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Yasin Munir, uh, can you hear us, sir? Yes, please. Thank uh, you very much. Sir, yes, yes. I'm really grateful for sparing your valuable time and uh, really thankful to you that uh, you have uh, guided us, our guided us and our students, our faculty uh, on how to write a good thesis and we are looking forward more sessions like this so thank you very much sir for thank you us. so much yeah. i'm sure, I'm sure. I, uh, thank you very much indeed i i just want to uh, th special thanks because i think it should be thank first, you so in much, the yeah. first in the series and it should continue uh, i'm sure you uh, we are availing your quarantine time in malaysia you are sitting there so inshallah hope to see you soon again thank you very much for uh, sparing so much time we took so much liberty of uh, taking your time so thank you very much okay uh, my my last um, remark perhaps thank you for the opportunity given uh, i'm sure we can continue with professor Usana, who i know okay 
um, has equally uh, experienced in these issues and so on, we can save hands, inshallah. So let me conclude by saying thank you again and Allah Hafiz to everyone. Okay. Um, if there are any more avenues for me to be involved, I'd be more than happy to help out, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum and thank you again. Thank, thank you so much. Thank Allah Hafiz. Salam. Allah Hafiz. Yes, yes, please. I can hear you. Sir? Okay, sir. Yes, uh, no, first, please guide me and also, ma'am, uh, Vice Chancellor. We have at least uh, 10 more questions. Uh, should we continue the session or should we take it to the next session? I think oh, I we think should consider the next session or if uh, Madam is convenient and available, then uh, we can. Yeah, I can, I can, I can start. do it quickly. I can do it. Yeah. Okay, that's okay, great. right. Madam. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next question. Respected ma'am, let me read it out for you. It's, it's a very, it's a very uh, a naive question that anyone can actually come across with. Madam, uh, the student is asking while selecting for a thesis or going for your research at the very start, there are always two options available. You can always go for a qualitative method and you can always go for a qualitative method. So which one we should go for very, very precisely if I may ask and, uh, and, and what is more beneficial in which method there is a bit of ease to find data as well? Well, um depending on the idea of a student who wants to work on and uh, uh, sometimes it depends on the supervisor's expertise and supervisors if they are using mixed method they would guide them to follow that stream if they are quantitative they would like students to follow quantitative uh, but now i think there is a mixed method and even quantitative supervisor who are focusing on quantitative they were also expecting their students to at least produce one study i'm talking about phd level um, which should be qualitative so that they can explore further. So I don't think so there is something which you have to, depending on the nature or the topic you want to work on uh, and your hypothesis and how, uh, what actually you want to do. Uh, so quantification and then qualitative uh, deals with in-depth kind of in information. Quantitative is actually allows you to gather a huge number of sample or data and then analyze it in very systematic way using different softwares. So it's up to you and your supervisor to decide uh, what you want to do. But the recent trend is combination of both quantitative and qualitative. So do one study and then some questions are which can be uh, answered through qualitative research. So you may have to follow use both. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yasin, if you would like to add any point at any any instant, please do that. Please feel uh, very comfortable in doing that. Now, you, Madam has uh, joined the role of Professor Arman, and you be in the your uh, supportive role like Madam was doing earlier. Thank you so much. Okay, Madam. The next question is: How can we write the references? How can we write the references without uh, the plagiarism? Write references without plagiarism. I think there are uh, different mics on. Um, plagiarism references are not, uh, uh, you know, when plagi plagiarism is checked, then you have to take list of references out. So references do not add to plagiarism. Uh, if you don't give references, then you most probably will tend to uh, plagiarize work because uh, the plagiarism means that you are reporting somebody's work or uh, without actually giving them due credit and reporting it as it is para without paraphrasing. So plagiarism is something different. If you, uh, it, it, it is different from citing references. So references uh, are two types. Um, there are two things. One is citation and other one is list of references. Citation is when you are reporting in your introduction and literature review you are citing author's surname and year on then bracket close and you know in parentheses uh, and then you produce that in the list of references so uh, it, it is not linked with plagiarism uh, if you do not cite and if you do not give references then you most probably are plagiarizing so acknowledging somebody's work is not plagiarism uh, unless you acknowledge somebody's work. but uh, having said that 
you have to produce their work in your own uh, you know paraphrasing in your own words so it can be let's say because i'm from psychology so i may define personality and if fried has fried, different people have given uh, definition of personality in different ways and you are synthesizing those definition so you may have to give n number of references because you are synthesizing their definitions so this is uh, how you go about it so it has it, it is not related to plagiarism thank you so much ma'am thank you so much and uh, the next question uh, i would like to move on is is a basic question but uh, probably the student is actually uh, she, she is yes, sir. de la vez yes de la vez and she is asking that research is only uh, that when we perform in writing only or uh, there are many other things as well it should it be in the writing form only and if we do it then it will be called a research and secondly uh it's it is asked about uh, the citations that uh, how we can actually add into the work well citation i have answered already uh, in the previous answer to the previous question um, defining research research is actually searching same thing again and again um, there might be same phenomena being researched by n number of people before you but you want to research it from different perspective with different population with different um, you know in different culture um, with different methodology um, so research is not only name of writing you will write after um, conducting some empirical work or some uh, you know practical uh, integration of material so it depending on subject to subject for example there are subjects like um, sciences uh, which will have lab experiments and then um, done them such an experimentation and putting them together and then producing in form of pieces uh, in different chapters that is uh, introduction literature review methodology uh, results and then discussion so these are actually major chapters of a thesis so if you don't have done that empirical work which is in methodology chapter uh, then you of course can't write so methodology chapter may be quantitative research may be qualitative research uh and sometime you synthesize somebody's work in a different manner uh, for probably would like to work on sunna or hadith or uh, so depending on the subject you would choose the uh, methodology but methodology has to be there without met- methodology you can't write your uh, thesis so research is not only writing research is actually doing research mean empir- gathering empirical data gathering data in different form and then producing it in written form i hope it's surprised. thank you so much yes ma'am thank you so much for the comprehensive answer uh, the next question is the student is asking that how to write the chapter 3 as it is a very important chapter how should what should be the title of it and how should we write chapter 3 what what is chapter 3 i mean methods methodology methodology okay yes, yes, yes that normally it is method. research methodology normally in yeah. all yeah. the thesis it is research methodology. you know from these questions it seems that we can have a separate lecture and separate kind of a session on these but i would try to uh, answer these questions since i committed uh, methodology chapter would vary from the method or the strategy you are using if you are uh, using qualitative or quantitative however i would like to tell you the main uh, main parts of method section or method chapter number one is research design second one is sample um, and third one is uh, the assessment how you are carrying how you are gathering how you are what empirical how you are doing your empirical work and then procedure ethical guidelines or ethical consideration because i am talking from social sciences point of view and even in uh, sciences you have ethical consideration while you are doing some experimental work on animals or some readings or using certain techniques that um, then there is should be some bio protection like for example if in these days if uh, somebody is working on covid or in in lab so is he or she protected or taken care of that they are protected so ethical consideration from my point of view could be a chapter method chapters integral part so you have to start what research design you are using then you have to give description of your sample 
uh, or the population which you are um, including in your uh, or on whom you are working and then your map, uh, instrumentation or your measurement uh, techniques you are using and then procedure how did you collect your data was it interview was it you distributed questionnaires did you send on email or did you use social media for gathering information and you have to report it as you did it and then you move on to ethical consideration so this is the chapter uh, chapter 3 Thank you so much, ma'am. After this, we'll be having only three more questions. I've closed the sessions for question answers further. Uh, ma'am, uh, the student uh, Khatija is, is asking that is it just to have quantitative research now because the pandemic has struck the whole world and all the dimensions have been changed. Please provide us with your expert opinion that whether we should restrict uh, to quantitative research or we can also go for the qualitative one. Uh, listen again again it would depend upon what kind of research a student want to conduct um, if you are in talking about pandemic and you can't get exposure to go in field you may use this uh, social media there are different kind of techniques which allow you to gather data but if you are using somebody's tool and somebody's questionnaire then you have to take permission from them to use online because they if the author allows you to use that um, to face to face situation uh, now you are changing to a different mode so when you ask for permission to the author then you have to take permission of using it, it on social social media because sometimes there is a you know uh, maybe the questionnaire author doesn't allow you to do that so this is important to consider of course if you think that this is your requirement and your supervisor guides you that you can do it quantitative quantitative research has its own inherent characteristics and advantages it doesn't mean that it is completely disadvantages um, you have you have to have a proper conceptualization and rigorous methodology uh, to do that and even if you want to do for qualitative research uh, from social sciences point of view uh, you may choose the topic which allows you to gather data on six or seven participants if you want and maybe they are in your closer vicinity and by following all covid protection you can gather that that data that doesn't stop you but take make sure that a researcher keeps in mind the logistics and how promotive the environment is to collect the data and do research and they can always choose topics accordingly uh, researcher is not uh, should also take care of themselves they should also uh, ensure that they are safer when they are exposed to a certain situations for example infectious diseases or you know Uh, if they are working in certain kind of patients, so this is very very important that you choose the topic of your research in consultation of your supervisor, and the supervisor and you should take care that you do not expose yourself to such situations where you yourself are at risk. So this is up to your supervisor and you to decide which way you want to go. Either you want to have both quantitative or qualitative, if you want to have either of those. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Second last question before I uh, put forward the last one. I'm merging the two questions together. Uh, the student is asking, what if our results are not same as our hypothesis or the research findings totally comes opposite to the literature? Uh, then what should we do? Why cannot we put in our uh, cultural context and why have we been asked to do more literature reviews and finding more uh, results to actually match to our research findings well very good question uh, i think this is a, a bigger concern and there is a, a huge misconception around it um, in pakistan uh, the researchers think that only that research is useful uh, where the hypothesis is supported and the analysis are in the line of what they expected to begin with <clears throat> that may not be true otherwise there is no need to do research and if you have done generally uh, as i said earlier if your methodology is rigorous if you the techniques you have used or measures you have used are reliable um if uh, the procedure is very stringent and uh, proper if you have taken care of covariates or because there are some confoundings which you have not uh, taken care of and you just collected data uh, by combining n number of variables variable 1 and variable 2 or 3 uh, without having any theoretical uh, rationale attached to it and there are also some phenomena which are very very culturally sensitive uh, so you have to be careful that social sciences uh, human behavior is very much influenced by culture 
so if you get some uh, findings which are for example um, what we do uh, in 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 our society for disciplining of children or the teachers practices or students practices are entirely different from what the practices in the west or the other countries so you might have some literature which is entirely di reporting different kind of findings so you don't have to worry about it uh, don't try to look for more and more data because sometime you may think that there was something wrong uh, because people have not filled in questionnaires properly uh, and you can see the pattern that if you have given certain kind of option and one has ticked without uh, thinking the same option so this uh, after collecting data you have to screen your data and exclude those cases which you think are not um, properly done or sometimes you have a very um, uh, for example gender is a very key variable and you find that 50 students have not or 50 participants have not reported gender so it means that there is either you go back and of course uh, get the, that field or if that is online or through different ways you may have to discard those so you know di discarding doesn't mean uh, that you are trying to support your hypothesis discarding of your questionnaires mean that you are trying to see that they are filled genuinely and because you have to then do a rigorous exercise of entering data in SPSS or any other software and then analyzing and writing up complete uh, chapter on it and then at the end of the day you see there was a flaw there was a problem the data you show your supervisor and supervisor says why did you include this why didn't you ask this so it is always very very important keep your supervisor in the loop uh, starting from uh, for example my students are not sometimes happy with me because i would like them to identify the covariates which might affect the dependent variables it's we we say independent variable and dependent variable we don't see what would affect the dependent variable other than the independent variable which we have chosen so this is if you have conducted every all the research and at the end of the day you see there is no relationship between the two it doesn't mean that it's not your hypothesis is not supported it means your research is flawed because you have not taken care of okay, what the link between the two is might be affected by n number of variables which you have not even asked so it may be family system it may be parental education let's say you are asking about uh, looking at children's performance and you just have iq intelligence or children performance or whatever single variable so don't worry about it because you will learn research with the passage of time you start from your bs you move on to your mphil you move on to your phd so all these are learning exercises but learning doesn't mean that you keep on doing it for assignment sake start developing in interest in research and you will try to understand where the flaws are try to pay more attention to your work in, in instead of working on assignment rather than focusing on um, without reading books try to look at flaws because sometimes there are questionnaires which would, which might need recoding rather reverse coding and a student don't do that if they sometimes if they have not done that so wo jo neutralize kar dega jo positive uh, written questions hain wo negatively written questions ki jo effect total hoga to wo unko nullify kar dega so aapko ye sara kuch karna data ko screen karna uski uh, integrity ko dekhna fir usko proper tarike se process karna aur uske baad preliminary analysis jaise inhone kaha uh, dr imran sahab ne preliminary analysis run karna usse aapko bahut kuch nazar aa jata hai your data will tell you about the validity of your um, and uh, data jo aapne collect kiya hai aur aapki uh, proposed ke aage kya hone ja raha hai so it is very very important do it properly and don't worry about what the findings are you don't have to collect more data for that thank you so much madam and the final question yeah. very much yeah. yes sir yeah. sir yeah okay yeah. uh, Uh, madam it's not our responsibility being a researcher to make uh, forcefully acceptable uh, hypothesis and uh, there are other reasons uh, if uh, hypothesis is not accepted uh, it may be the reason of data normality and uh, it may be the reason um, researcher has not identified outliers in data and uh, it may be the reason of uh, scale validity and reliability so there are uh, many other reasons uh, that causes uh, rejection of hypothesis so over to suhail sir thank you thank you dr sir 
Very well said. The final question, which very much relates to uh, the, the psychology of students as well, madam. Uh, yeah, the student is asking now that research problem is uh, one thing that we all are very much concerned about and fear it as well at the same time. So how can we formulate a good research problem or find a good research problem? And how can we overcome our fears uh, concerning our confidence? Are we going in the right way? What should be what would be done by the end of uh, the whole of it to us? Should we get through it? Should we will be able to submit the thesis in time? Will it be accepted and all this kind of things? Please, ma'am. This is quite a bigger big question. Um, actually, fear of research is um, something which has been uh, developed around it because if you have a command on some subject, because we teach research methods, I think in all BS subjects, we teach research methods then in MPhil and then we teach in research methods in uh, PhD. And this fear and misconceptions and you know, clarity of concepts still exist at certain level, uh, at all levels. Um, it's the, um, I would like to, uh, you know, you have a researcher mindset. You have to develop a researcher mindset. Uh, if you start liking research, you start thinking like a researcher, you start observing your environment around you. You, you don't have to, uh, you know, first you choosing a topic, actually should be of your interest. I, I ask my students ke aapko usme interest ho. Kyunki jab aapko interest hoga, to aap usko behtar tarikhe se karenge. Number two, look around you what is happening. As abhi Dr. Imran sahab ne ka, ke COVID ke upar kaam ho raha hai, to jab aap ek, ek research iski taraf karna shuru karenge, so when you start publishing or finding or you know putting something uh, together, people will be, reader will be more interested, journal publisher would be more interested to publish that, your work. Uh, aapko, you have to be really observant. You look at what you want to do. You might observe something happening at home. Uh, right now, kya logon ke andar ghar mein ke aggression bhad gayi hai? Kya ghar mein ke bachon, bachon ke jo behaviors hain, wo kya ho gaye hain? Bachche jo hain, wo kis tarah se uh, jittery ho rahe hain? Ya maabap unko kaise handle kar rahe hain? So, uh, uh, research is not something which is a, um, you know, uh, some, it doesn't have to be a mega thing. हम कोशिश करते हैं हमारे दिमाग में ये होता है कि पहली दफा ही हम एक बहुत खूबसूरत सी एक टॉपिक या एक प्रॉब्लम स्टेटमेंट बना लें ऐसा नहीं होता आप पहले आईडिया एक जनरल आईडिया कंसेप्टुअलाइज करते हो कि ये मेरा इंटरेस्ट है व्हिच इज अ ब्रॉडर एरिया ऑफ कोर्स और उस ब्रॉडर एरिया को फिर आप लिटरेचर रिसर्च और थ्योरेटिकल फ्रेमवर्क पढ़ पढ़ के फाइन ट्यून करते हो देन यू फोकस देन देन योर फोकस स्टार्ट्स कि ये मैं जनरल ये मैं करना चाहती हूं और वो करने के साथ साथ अपनी ऑब्जर्वेशन डिस्कशन जो आपने अभी बात की थी वो डिस्कशन और ऑब्जर्वेशन यहाँ पे आनी चाहिए वाली यू आर कंसेप्टलाइजिंग योर आइडिया और रिसर्च से डरने की कोई बात नहीं है अगर इफ यू मेक जो टाइम टेबल आई विल आस्क माई स्टूडेंट मेक अ रिसर्च डायरी एंड वो डायरी जो है उसके अंदर चीजें लिखते जाओ और उसके साथ साथ अपना टाइम टेबल भी बनाओ स्केजुअल भी कि मैंने ये काम इस वक्त तक करना है नंबर टू मल्टी टास्किंग वेन यू आर गैदरिंग योर डेटा Nobody is stopping you to write on your introduction chapter and your literature chapter. So, जब एक वक्त में एक चीज नहीं करें, हम हम usually ये करते हैं कि पहले मैं ये कर दूँ, फिर मैं ये कर दूँ, फिर मैं ये कर दूँ। उससे time बहुत जाया होता है और आपको फिर बाद में panic हो जाता है कि पता नहीं मैं कर सकूँ ना कर सकूँ। I tell you कि it is it is very interesting um, to do research. Once you do research, you become addicted to it and you can't actually leave it uh, because all the time you keep on thinking. कि ये भी हो जाए और इसके साथ साथ आपको डरने की कतन कोई जरूरत नहीं है क्योंकि मैंने जैसे अभी पहले भी कहा कि जिस जर्नी को आपने शुरू किया है जब मैंने शुरू किया था तो मुझे भी इसी तरह के इश्यूज थे अभी तो आपके पास बहुत से रिसोर्सेज हैं यू नो वाइल आई सी यू राइट नाउ यू हैव सो मैनी फ्री आर्टिकल अवेलेबल ऑनलाइन दैट वॉज नॉट अवेलेबल एट यू माइट है रिपोजिटरी ऑफ सो मैनी पीसीज अवेलेबल यू माइट हैव सो मैनी पब्लिश आर्टिकल अवेलेबल तो ये सारी की सारी जो आपको फैसिलिटीज अवेलेबल है अभी आपके पास टेक्नोलॉजी है विच वॉज नॉट देयर सो इसको आप यूटिलाइज करें आप इससे डरे नहीं अपना लिखना शुरू करें बिकॉज द थिंग इज के वेन यू स्टार्ट राइटिंग यू राइट एंड यू हैव अ लैक ऑफ कॉन्फिडेंस दैट आई डोंट राइट दैट इन अ गुड मैनर्स विच टेम्प्ट टू कॉपी पेस्ट आप लिखें लिख के उसे पढ़ें खुद से लिखें कोई इशू नहीं है दो दफा लिखें तीन दफा लिखें चार दफा लिखें वो सेंटेंस लिखें यू नो वेन वेन आई स्टार्ट इन लर्न Uh, my supervisor used to give comments which i would not understand and he would 
जस्ट नॉट क्लैरिफाई हमारे सुपरवाइज बहुत सी क्लैरिफिकेशन पे भी जाते हैं फिर भी इश्यूज होते हैं तो वो मुझे लेकिन उसने मुझे कहा था कि यू कैन गो टू एनी बडी टू गेट क्लैरिटी यू नो आई कैन कंसल्ट सो मेनी पीपल आई कैन कंसल्ट प्रोफेशनल नाउ यू हैव यूट्यूब उसके ऊपर सारी गाइडेंस पड़ी हुई है तो रिसर्च ऐसा कोई डरने वाली चीज नहीं है वंस यू डू इट डू इट सिंपल अगर आप बी के स्टूडेंट हैं तो डोंट मेक इट काइंड ऑफ अज प्रोजेक्ट ऑफ मीडिएशन मॉडरेशन और ये 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 बहुत मुझे हैवी काम करना है लेकिन आपको मेथडोलॉजी सीखने की जरूरत होती है क्योंकि बार दफा हम वो जो रिसर्च मेथड का कोर्स पढ़ रहे होते हैं हम समझते हैं ये सिर्फ रिसर्च मेथड में पास होने के लिए है जबकि ये एप्लीकेशन है ऑन वेन यू गो ऑन टू योर रिसर्च मेथडोलॉजी सैम्पलिंग कैसे करनी है सैम्पल आपकी रिसर्च का है क्या और आपने कौन सी स्ट्रेटजी यूज की जैसे इन्होंने डॉक्टर साहब ने कहा कि अभी लिखते वक्त ये ना हमें बताएं कि बस बहुत से लोग डेफिनेशन लिखना शुरू कर देते हैं सैम्पल ये होता है पॉपुलेशन ये होती है उन्होंने कहा ना कि जैसे हमें लगता है कि हम बेवकूफ हैं यू राइट वट वट एक्चुअली यू हैव डन यू राइट योर सैम्पलिंग की ये स्ट्रेटिफाइड सैम्पलिंग की ये नॉन प्रॉबिलिटी पर वट एवर सैम्पलिंग की बट यू देन शुड बी क्लियर वट इट इज अपने कॉन्सेप्ट क्लियर कीजिए बेसिक कॉन्सेप्ट उसके बाद मेथडोलॉजी को रिग्रेस कीजिए और अपना डेटा जो है जनरली कलेक्ट कीजिए आई डोंट थिंक देर इज एनी थिंग विच यू हैव टू वरी अबाउट thank you so much madam thank you so much for your valuable time and input uh, dr yasim ani can you please take it on from here offer your bundle of thanks to the honorable vice chancellor uh thank you madam for providing us opportunity to organize this uh, lecture series actually it's your motivation and your leadership that and you are our role model and it's your motivation that uh, today Uh, this session is possible just because of your motivation thank you very much actually i appreciate your efforts in bringing international um, vice chancellor level person as a speaker and i wish that we can continue everybody can continue from my team to do that uh, so thank right. you so hey for uh, for actually organizing this mainstreaming or uh, this is actually the second one this is not the first one uh, we already have one from chemistry but not on mainstreaming that was on microsoft teams so this is second in the series of international speakers inshallah we will continue with this and having on this uh, kind of medium is allowing other university students to uh, attend to so this is very good initiative and i would like that this continues thank you very much my team and thank you very much last week dr imran too because we would like to see him again and uh, thank you all the students from other universities and our university too join and we will think about it ke ye jo aapke research ke hai mai i was wondering ke we can think of one uh, topic at a time and then at least have zyada nahi to half an hour mein ek informal si aapke sath baat ho jaye if you want to uh, bajaye iske ke kitabe hain aap usko thoda sa conceptualize kar sake ke research idea kya hota hai usko kaise literature review kya hota hai uh, in um, making it more easier for you thank you very much ये सो है ओवर थैंक यू सो मच मैम जी मैडम थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर यासिन वुड यू लाइक टू गिव इट अ ओवरऑल रैप अप क्या आप इसको बड़ा नॉर्मली उसमें इन आवर रिलेटिव लैंग्वेज एक्स एज वेल चंद इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स शेयर करना चाहेंगे स्टूडेंट्स के साथ और प्रोबेबली वी विल टेक इट ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट सेशन जिसमें रिव्यू कर सकते हैं हम अगला सेशन शुरू करने से पहले जैसे आप आई थिंक टुडेस today's lecture is uh, just all about how to write a good uh, thesis and uh, what we have learned today is uh, our uh, our title our introduction our uh, problem statement our significance of the study our literature our methodology our discussion our analysis it should be aligned throughout or uh, i think it's enough and it's it was great experience it was a great contribution of can you camera please sorry sir aapki video nazar nahi aa rahi kindly on dekhiyega sir my camera is on and it may be it may take few seconds to display please continue please continue please continue apologies okay so it was very uh, amazing and wonderful experience uh, today we have learned a lot and uh, uh, students and even our faculty members have learned uh, that in thesis 
the title should be aligned with introduction with problem statement with significance of the research and even with hypothesis of the study and uh, how can we write a good literature uh, how our methodology should be and uh, how our analysis should be and how, how our conclusion uh, should be uh, we have learned a lot today and uh, it was very productive session and i am really honored that these two big personalities have joined us to cater the issues of students who are working currently on their thesis thank you very much thank you so much this is about to we were about to conclude the whole uh, discussion of today this was the first of the very first of the online lecture series that we are looking forward to carry on everyone and in the fact, name of the series of the lecture please ji doctor doctor please unmute your mic please sir i am really grateful to you as well and itsc support that uh, it's only possible for your support thank you so much doctor sir it's always been a pleasure to be in the supportive means uh, mm -hmm. so what i was saying is dr yasin munir has made it possible for all of us to join the very first online lecture series the very first lecture of the online lecture series with the topic of how to write a thesis inshallah we will be keeping you posted and when we are going to have our next session this is the very first time that we have done it and i apologize for any sort of inconvenience that you might have faced uh, nationally but to our uh, students and to uh, with the international participants as well i apologize for any inconvenience or any disconnects uh, but uh, i hope all the learning shared by the two of the most experienced uh in professionals uh, dr professor dr amran md azli and professor dr roxana kosar both are vice chancellors at the highest position in any educational institution university we have today uh, in our uh, education era these days i'm very thankful to both of the honorable vice chancellors for sparing their, their valuable time and sharing excellent knowledge with all of you most of the question has been answered if you still have any question i'll be leaving the email of dr yasin munir there you already most of you already have it for international participants you can always email them you can always email honorable vice chancellor and we can send you a response back very timely and effectively hope to see you and hope to join you in next online session very soon a very good day to all of you and thank you so much for bearing with us thank you for so much for your patience and understanding allah hafiz pakistan zindabad